All right, looks like we're live. Hello and good morning or good afternoon to everybody. My name is Thomas Graf. I am CTO and co-founder of iSurveillant, uh, chair of the eBPF governing board of our newly created eBPF foundation, and also one of the co-creators of Cilium. On behalf of the eBPF foundation, I would like to welcome all of you to this year's eBPF summit. It's absolutely amazing. I think at the time of this recording, we already had over 3000 registrations for the summit. So I'm really looking forward for the next two days. I believe we'll hear from fantastic speakers. Given the explosive interest in eBPF, I figured it makes sense to cover its current state and then also offer an outlook into the future of eBPF. So we'll hear some predictions from my side on how I believe eBPF will evolve and what it will unlock and what it will change. But before we get into that, I would like to give a very warm thank you to, to Liz and Duffy for hosting us today and tomorrow. They're doing a fantastic job. All right, so there's no better way but to start off uh, EBPF Summit than with like fantastic news. Last week, we announced the formation of the EBPF Foundation. Facebook, Google, iSurveillant, Microsoft, and Netflix We've all come together as founding members to create the eBPF Foundation. It is part of the Linux Foundation and will enable even better collaboration between the various eBPF projects and also ensure eBPF itself can grow and expand to additional platforms. An example of this is the expansion to the Windows kernel, which we'll hear more about in one of the talks later on. As part of this foundation, we are establishing two boards the eBPF governing board, which will take care of running the eBPF foundation itself and the eBPF steering committee. The steering committee will drive the vision of eBPF forward. It will provide technical guidance and also speak on behalf of the eBPF community. In the spirit of open source, the steering committee composes of people who have either created eBPF or heavily contributed to it over the course of the last few years. And this is something that we want to keep. We are a contribution-based foundation, and we want our boards to represent that. If you want to know more about the foundation, or if you're interested in joining, feel free to refer to the charter available at ebpf.io slash charter. Before we dive into more where eBPF is today, I want to quickly look back and cover why we have created eBPF back in 2014. For those not familiar with my own personal background, I was, or I guess I still am, a Linux kernel developer in total for, I guess, almost 20 years now. Um, how did kernel development, how did the world of kernel development look like before eBPF stepped in and changed everything? Let's look at an example. When an application developer wanted a new feature, let's say to observe an application, the application developer would walk up to the kernel developer and ask, hey, kernel dev developer, please add this new feature to the Linux kernel because I need to observe my application. In this example, we're using observability, but it really applies to any feature in the Linux kernel that is exposed to user space and then consumed or used by end users. The kernel developer would come back and say, okay, just give me one year to convince the entire Linux kernel community that your change is good and needed for everybody. A year later, the kernel developer would eventually come back and say, okay, I'm done. The upstream Linux kernel now supports this. Cool, right? But not really enough for the majority of us. Most of us consume um, Linux via a Linux distribution. And the Linux distribution will ship a particular Linux kernel version. Linux distributions, in particular enterprise distributions, will not always ship the latest kernel version. So in reality, it will then take another five years or so before the Linux distribution would eventually get back to the application developer with, good news, our Linux distribution now ships a kernel version with the required feature that you asked for. Obviously, by the time, the requirements of the application developer have completely changed. As a kernel developer, this was kind of the story of my life. I have experienced over and over again that, for example, modern applica application uh, platforms such as Kubernetes or container runtimes be built on features, kernel features that are 10 or 20 years old. Obviously, these kernel features were not built with the requirements of such modern application platforms in mind. So it always felt like pushing a rectangle through a round hole. 
eBPF changes this. By making the kernel programmable, a feature requested by an application developer or somebody else can be implemented with eBPF and loaded into the kernel, allowing for on-demand or dynamic innovation. What used to take years can now be done in days. So instead of the kernel developer responding, it can be an eBPF developer responding. Okay, the kernel can't do this yet. So let me quickly solve this with eBPF. And then a couple of days later, the eBPF developer can provide a solution and start iterating on the solution together with the application developer. And even better, deploying this new feature will not even involve rebooting machines or any other heavyweight operations. In a sense, this is what eBPF is, is, is about. It's allowing for a massive wave of new kernel or operating system level-based innovation. And it's changing a fundamental formula that change or innovation that used to take years can now be done in days. And this is unlocking, this, is, this will enable um, completely new ecosystem of, of tooling. So where is eBPF today? This is, the, this, is, this is what it enables. How is it used today? Uh, before we dive into, into more concrete use cases, I wanted to quickly cover the overall landscape. So eBPF today is used in a variety of use cases and an entire landscape has formed. Um, so before we dive into the very concrete, very specific use cases, let's look at the, the layers first to understand what depends on what and how does the overall stack look like. Most eBPF applications can be associated with one of the following high-level use cases, networking, security, and observability. One layer below, so one layer below the use cases, we have eBPF projects, um, which solve one or more um, of these use cases and provide solutions directly to end users. This includes projects such as BCC, Cilium, Falco, Catron, or BPF Trace. I've listed just a few. These are the major eBPF projects. There are many more uh, that are either being created right now or already uh, in production quality. Below that layer are a set of libraries or SDKs, which, typically are, which are typically used by the just mentioned projects. And these libraries bridge to the world of the eBPF runtime. The libraries are usually targeting one specific programming language and offer bindings. So there are projects that include eBPF bindings for Go, C, C++, Rust, and Python. And then on the lowest level, this is where the operating system lives. We have the eBPF runtime itself, the eBPF verifier, the just-in-time compiler, and also the helper API. We'll hear uh, several talks throughout the summit that will dive into all of these different layers. When we talk about eBPF today, in particular in the context of the foundation, we refer to this entire stack. Okay, so let's look at some very concrete examples on how eBPF is used in real life today. These are just selected few, obviously not, in, not including everything, but one example for each high level use case. All the way on the left, we see Facebook leveraging eBPF for load balancing and denial of service mitigation. This work has been open sourced under uh, Project Catron. Um, Facebook engineers have spoken to Catron in last year's eBPF summit, and there's also several public talks available. The next example is Google Cloud using Cilium to add eBPF based networking, networking security, and various observability features to Google's managed Kubernetes platforms. GK and Antos. Google Cloud is not the only cloud provider using eBPF, it's just it's one example. Um, we actually have um, members of Google, of the Google team speaking at this summit as well. Uh, Netflix is using BCC and auto tooling for application tracing, profiling, and performance troubleshooting. We'll hear from Brendan Gregg in a, in a bit uh, on how to get started with eBPF observability using exactly this, uh, this set of tools. Last but not least, we'll also hear from Apple at this summit uh, on how they use eBPF and Falco for a variety of security use cases. So given this wide adoption, what is next? And so I want to dive into a, a set of predictions and then we'll see uh, in the future, we can see how accurate they have been. Maybe actually in one year from now at the next year's summit, we can come back and actually look at them together. So let's, let's dive in. Prediction number one. EBPF will make observability intelligent. EBPF has massively changed observability already, 
But I expect eBPF to make observability a lot more intelligent going forward. What I mean by this is that observability will stop just exporting samples or data and then rely on filtering later on. Instead, eBPF will allow making intelligent decisions using the programmability of eBPF uh, on what should be exported or on what can be safely ignored as noise. In fact, Jana uh, in her keynote later on will go into exactly these details in her, in her keynote uh, and, and why this is crucial in particular while observing microservices ar architectures. Prediction number two, the eBPF will be the SDN of the cloud native edge and bridge cloud on-premise and edge. SDN or software defined networking has completely transformed networking during the virtualization era. I believe that eBPF will be the SDN of the cloud native edge. It is a perfect match to address challenges such as multi-cloud, bridging hybrid environments and or building meshes to the edge. eBPF is an ideal solution for networking challenges because of its programmability. It is equally well fitted to drive networking for, for pure cloud providers or for, pure, for cloud environment usage, but can also implement traditional network protocol such as NPLS, BGP and so on. It can do so while providing a consistent and coherent user experience. So I expect more end users, cloud providers to adopt eBPF, for example, by using Cilium to provide consistent network services in their respective environments, whether this is in cloud, whether this is a hybrid environment, whether this is a sealed airtight on-premise environment. eBPF has the right tool set to implement uh, or address the challenges for all of them. Prediction number three, eBPF is the technology to win service mesh. Um, obviously a bold prediction, but it seems pretty obvious to me at this point. Service mesh is a great way to think about service connectivity, load balancing control, authentication, tracing, and so on. But the implementation with a sidecar based data path as presently used in most service mesh implementations is far from, a, far from ideal. It is inefficient and complex to operate. eBPF will provide the same or better control in the data path while providing the, like the, the actual service mesh end user experience that we're all looking for. So I expect eBPF to be one of the, the prominent data path layers for service meshes. Prediction number four, eBPF will provide deeper context across layers for fundamentally better security. This is a pretty abstract prediction, so let me add some color to this. Security heavily depends on understanding the context. The more context you have when making a decision, the better position you have to make a good, a good decision. This is no different with security. Understanding the identity and intent of actors, requests, and communication is crucial. eBPF will dramatically increase the available context when doing enforcement, and also when providing visibility. So I think we'll see solutions that can combine context from the network level, process runtime level, and maybe even include information from the orchestration system level and take, then take all of that into account when enforcing actions, including for example, feeding from real-time based historical context use. In parallel, eBPF will allow achieving this better security model at a low overhead which I think is crucial as well. Prediction number five. I think this is one of the important ones. eBPF will make having observability everywhere the norm. Whenever I talk to users or customers, having observability is one of the most requested asks, whether it is understanding the application performance, request latencies, security compliance metrics, or network visibility, having visibility is absolutely key. It's frightening how little of observability is available in many environments. eBPF will change this and make it the norm to have visibility across all, all these layers. Why? The main two reasons why observability is not available today are lack of opportunity, so not having the opportunity to see what's going on, or imposed overhead. eBPF solves both of these challenges. eBPF, because it lives in the operating system level, can see everything from low level networking on the wire to runtime system calls, what's going on in the kernel, all the way into in instrumenting applications, 
function tracing, or even parsing application protocol requests. It can do so with a very low overhead. This connects back to the intelligent observability prediction uh, that I made earlier. If we can make more intelligent decisions on what to observe, what to capture, the overhead will be lower on the, overhead, on the overall system. All right, last prediction, final prediction. Um, eBPF will allow for networking, observability, and security tooling with an amazing user experience. Okay, this is very generic, but I think it's the most important prediction overall because it connects everything together. In the end, everything we are doing, everything we're building, we're, we're building for users and customers. And we're optimizing for our users to have a good and amazing user experience. Whether it's solutions to provide network security, application request tracing, runtime security, threat prevention, or monitoring systems, the quick innovation cycle that eBPF unlocks will allow us to interact with users quickly and interact with them. This will lead to a fundamentally better user experience for all of us with the eBPF tooling that we're building together. All right, that's all the predictions. I really hope you enjoyed this talk um, and I hope you were able to extract some useful information from it. I'm really excited about eBPF and the future it has ahead. And with this, I would like to say thank you and open it up for questions.